Amen. What a reminder that we need the Lord through everything. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the book of 2 Timothy. Paul's letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. When you find your place, we'll begin reading in verse 10. Second Timothy 3 verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire live godly, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you... Continue in what you have learned and what you have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you once again for bringing us together among your people. Father, I pray as we look into your word that you would open up our eyes, give us understanding in your word, clear our minds of anything that is not God-centered, that is not focused on you. God, help us to understand the Word of God today and apply it to our lives. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the Word of God. And, Tim and Paul has been speaking to Timothy. He's been writing this letter to Timothy, uh, kind of giving him some last instructions. I say last instructions because this is the last letter that the Apostle Paul will write in the Bible. This is his last epistle, his last book, before he dies um, by the hand of, of, of someone who was killing Christians. By Rome is where he would die. And so anyway, Paul is giving Timothy some last instructions, and we've kind of entitled these messages, Dear Timothy, and then whatever the thought may be. Well, this morning, what we're going to speak on and try to get to through this text is, Dear Timothy, continue on. Continue. So we're going to look at this and begin to see what Paul is telling Timothy. We've read the text. Paul has been telling Timothy as of late about watching for people who teach a false doctrine. Now, if you remember, when, Tim, when Paul first started this letter, he was talking about persecutions and troubles that Timothy would go to go through as a pastor, as a preacher. And then he moved on to speaking of problems within a church and how Timothy's to deal with those things. There are many obstacles that you're going to have in your life for Christ and your ministry. And then Timothy has been speaking of false teachers that's going to come against him, teaching things that are contrary to the Word of God. And so now we come, as he's been talking about this, now we see Paul is about to tell us, not in the text that we've read this week, but in next week, about... All Scripture is God-breathed. And that's really where Paul is getting to. That's, where Paul, that's the crescendo, you could say, of 2 Timothy. But before now, before that, Paul is giving Timothy some final instruction. And he begins to tell him about being a follower. Now, I believe through, through Paul being inspired by the Holy Spirit, led and directed by God's Holy Spirit to write the Word of God, this is God's message for us. This isn't just Paul's message to Timothy. This is God's message for us today. Well, I believe through this text that God wants us to be followers. I believe God wants us to be followers, followers ultimately of Christ. He is our Master, He is our Lord, and we are to be followers of Christ. But if you notice what Paul told Timothy, Paul said, You, however, have followed my... And then he goes into this list of things he's speaking of. So Paul as Timothy's mentor, Paul as Timothy's discipler, Paul as Timothy's leader has been leading Timothy in a way of living, leading Timothy in, the, in a way of believing. And Paul, God through Paul is teaching Timothy how it's good to be a follower. Now, sometimes that can almost be negative. Well, you're just a follower. You're just doing what other people do. But in the kingdom of God, it is good to be a follower. It's bad to go out on your own and to do things your own way. It's bad to 
instead of believing the scriptures that we've always been taught and, and, and following in the same line of the church we've always followed to stray and do our own thing, that's where false doctrine comes from. But in the kingdom of God, it is good to be a follower and understand that we do follow people, but ultimately we are following Jesus Christ. That's who we're following. So God through this text is telling us to be a follower, but God is also telling us to be leaders. Paul is an example of a leader. Paul is an example of someone who has lived a godly life. No, he's not lived a perfect life. Yes, he has failed, and yes, he has needed the same grace of God that he's preaching about, but Paul has set him, God has set Paul up as a leader for the church to follow. So God wants us to be leaders. God wants us to be followers. God wants us to be leaders. And then I think we see a principle here. In order to be a good leader, we must first be a good follower. I do believe that God wants us to be uh, leaders of other people. God wants us to lead people to Christ. God wants us to lead people into a right relationship with Christ. God wants us, the Christians, the church members here at Chunky Baptist Church, to lead people to be faithful followers as disciples of Christ. But in order for us to faithfully do this, in order for us to do our job as Christians and as disciples right, we must first be followers faithful followers of God, faithful followers of other Christians who live their life for Christ. We must be leaders and we must be followers. In order to be a good leader, we must first be a good follower. Paul is about to give us a list of things in which he was an example for Timothy. Not only was he an example for Timothy, but he says, you have followed this. You've been doing this. So he's about to rehearse to Timothy the things that he's already been doing as a believer as a disciple, as a Christian. And I think we need to take note of these things and to see, make sure that we're doing these things as well. So Paul says, you however. Now, the, where the however comes from, Paul just got through talking about people who are leaving the faith. Paul just got, in, in, in the beginning of chapter 3, Paul was talking about people who uh, were lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, but treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's who Paul had been talking about. And now Paul transitions and says, you, however, you've not been living that way. You've not conducted your life in that fashion. You, however, Timothy, have followed. What has Timothy followed? Well, let's look. This is what we're going to look at through the majority of the message today. How Timothy followed. What Timothy followed. You, however, have followed my teaching. That's the first thing Paul mentions. And I believe it's important. Paul has already been talking about teaching. Paul has already been talking about... Now, Paul used the word teaching. This word is also doctrine. This is what we believe. What we believe is important. What we believe, and this is not only speaking of what we personally believe, but what we've been taught to believe by the Word of God. This is our authority, church. We have no other authority. But we must understand in saying that, that we live in a generation, we live in a world that says that there is no one certain truth. That truth is whatever you make it to be. If you want to believe that um, to get to heaven you got to ride in a car, for you that's truth. If you want to believe in order to get to heaven you have to follow the teachings of Muhammad or of Buddha or of whatever you can uh, think of in your mind, this world says if you believe it, then that's truth for you. But the Bible stands opposed to that way of believing. There is certain truth. And with there being certain truth, there is also things that are not truth that are lies and they should be called lies. If, if you are believing and trusting in any other way other than Jesus Christ, faith in Him, trusting in Him, repenting from your sins and trusting only in Jesus Christ and His righteousness to bring you to heaven, if you trust in anything outside of that, then you believe a lie. You have been deceived. You say, oh, Brother Matt, in this world, the greatest offense, the greatest tragedy, the greatest offense in this world is telling somebody they're wrong today. 
But if someone believes in a way to get to God outside of the truths of this scripture and in that alone, then they believe a lie, they are wrong, they have been deceived, and they must repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul says, Timothy, you have followed my teaching. You have followed salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You have followed that the Word of God is inspired and is good for everything that we need. You have followed the fact that the Word of God is our final authority. Timothy, you have done this. You have followed this. You have believed this. And now you are teaching it to others. Where Paul has already said... That which you've heard and believed, now teach it to faithful men who will in turn teach it to others. You see, what we are to do, the commission we've been given by God, the job that we have is to disciple others, to preach the Word of God, the sound doctrines of Scripture from, uh, to the church, and then the church believes it, they receive it, and then they go into their homes and communities and begin to teach it to other people. That's what we're to do. That's our calling. That's how the kingdom of God grows and expands by you taking the word of God and bringing it to the world. So Paul says, Timothy, you have followed my teaching. But he doesn't only say that. You have followed my teaching. You have followed my conduct. You have followed my conduct. That's, that is a way of life. That is obedience to God. So, along with believing what's right, you've believed the gospel. You've believed that salvation is by Jesus Christ alone, faith in Jesus Christ alone. But now, you, your belief hasn't just stopped there with something that you do in your mind. Your belief and your faith has turned into action. And you have conducted your life in a way that is proper. Paul says, I've done, this is my conduct. Paul says, Timothy, you are following my conduct. So Paul says, I've laid an example for you, Timothy. You've seen how I've lived my life. And Timothy followed Paul. Timothy followed Paul everywhere, much like the disciples followed Jesus in his three, three and a half years of ministry. They followed Paul. He watched Paul react. He watched how Paul react to situations. He watched how Paul responded to people. He watched how Paul prayed for people. He watched how Paul gave to, to the church and gave to charity to gave to people who had needs. He watched how Paul um, lived his life. And now Paul says, now you're living the life. You're, you're living according to my conduct. Now, we know whose conduct Paul was living according to. It was Jesus Christ. It was the way of the Master, the way of, 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 of Christ, the, Christ, the way of Christianity. And now Timothy has taken that, and Timothy says, I know, how Paul, I know how Paul conducted himself financially. He was a man of character. He didn't withhold money from people he owed, and he didn't do whatever. So I'm going to do this. He said, I remember how Paul treated the poor. And so I'm going to treat the poor the way Paul treated the poor, which is the way Christ treated the poor. I know how Paul reacted when someone did him wrong, when someone slapped him, when someone cursed him, and that happened a lot to Paul, and it happened a lot also to Timothy. I watched the way he lived his life, and I want to live like that. I want to, do, I want to be like that. I, I have a good example to follow in Paul. Paul has a good example to follow in Jesus Christ. Ultimately, I'm following Christ through Paul. I'm going to conduct my life the way Paul taught me to conduct my life. This is so important for the church today. What do we hear people say? I don't want to go to church. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. Now, a lot of that is, a lot of that is false accusations. A lot of it is false accusations. But a lot of it can be true as well. They may have seen certain people who claim to know Christ live in a way that's contrary to what Christ wants us to live. If that's the case for us, then we need to ask God to forgive us. And we need to live in such a way that shines Jesus Christ. Paul, uh, Jesus talked about, or well, the Bible talks about, glorifying God with our good works. Bringing glory to Him through the way we live our life. Now, understand this. I am not preaching that in order to go to heaven, you have to live a good life. That's not what I'm preaching. In order to go to heaven, you have to trust in Jesus' good life. But in order to, to, to shine the light of Christ to this world, we must be good citizens. 
We must be uh, good parents. We must be good church members. We must be good at our jobs and, and living a right life and not deceiving, not cheating, and things of that nature because God has called us to live a life of righteous conduct, glorify God with our good works. This is what we're to do. So Paul says, Timothy, you followed, you followed what I taught you. You followed the word of God. Timothy, you followed my conduct. You're living righteously as I lived righteously. But then Paul says, this, Timothy, you've also followed my aim in life. What was Paul aiming for? What was this example that he set for young Timothy that he's so encouraged that Timothy is following? Paul's aim in life was this. He tells us pretty plainly in his writings. He says that I think best in Philippians 1 verse 20. He says, according to my earnest expectations and my hope, that in nothing I should be ashamed. He don't want to be ashamed of anything that he does. He don't want to live a certain life and look back and say, well, I'm ashamed. I wish I hadn't done that. So according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I would be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now, here's his aim. Christ shall be magnified in my body. <laughs> That's what Paul wanted. That was his aim in life, was to glorify Jesus Christ. Paul wasn't living, the, Paul didn't believe how he believed, and Paul didn't live the life that he lived, so someone would come and pat him on the back and say, Paul, you're such a good preacher. Paul, you're such a good believer. Paul, you're such a good Christian. That's not why Paul did the things that he did. Paul wanted to defer all praise, defer all glory to Jesus Christ. That was his aim. That was his desire. And I believe it's summed up like this. I believe that the aim that Paul lived and the aim that we should live should be summed up like this. To glorify God by the spreading of the gospel to the nations. That's our aim. That's what we're going for. That's what we're aiming for in this life. And I believe that everything that we do, every individual move that we make should line up behind this goal and this mission. Are you a mother? Are you a father? Are you a grandparent? Your aim in being a mother, your aim in being a father, your aim in being a grandparent is to glorify God by spreading the gospel to the nation. You should view your family life as raising up people in a certain way to believe a certain way and to conduct their lives in a certain fashion that they would go out and glorify God by spreading the gospel to their communities and ultimately the nations. You, are you working a job? On that job, your goal and your aim should be to glorify God by spreading the gospel to the nations. How do we connect our jobs with that? Well, we know that in order to live our life, we have to go get a job and make money. And we make money. We, we pull in that check. And we pay our bills. We do everything we're supposed to do. But we also give to the church. And in giving to the church, we are working a job so we may make money and help send money to the missionaries that's helping to glorify God by spreading the gospel Glorify God by spreading the gospel to the nations. Whatever it is that we do, whatever it is that we do in this life, we should be a gospel-focused people. Everything. There is no job too menial. There is no calling too small that we should not do it to glorify God by spreading the gospel of Christ to the nations. Everything that we do, everything that we do is summed up in this, that we want Jesus to be glorified. It's not so I can be glorified. It's not so I, someone can look at me and say, hey, they're doing a good job. It's because I want Jesus to be made much of. I want somebody to brag on Jesus, therefore I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Because my, my goal is not self-centered. My goal as a believer is Jesus-centered, is gospel-centered. So everything I do, here's my aim in life, and that was Paul's aim in life. Well, guess who else adopted this aim of life? Timothy. Timothy believed how Paul believed, the Word of God. Timothy conducted his life the way Paul conducted his life, righteously. And Timothy's aim of life was the same aim of life of Paul, was to glorify God through the spreading of gospel to the nations. Number four, he says, you followed my faith. You followed my faith, my unshakable confidence in God. Now, Paul went through a lot. Paul suffered. 
We'll talk about that a little more a little, a little later on in the message. Paul was persecuted. He used to persecute believers before he was saved. And then God saved him. And one of the first messages that God gave Paul was this. I'm calling you and setting you aside for the purpose of suffering. Through your suffering, Paul, I'm going to be glorified. So, what we see here is this. Before I go into my other point, and I don't want to go too far into that, Paul had faith in God. Paul trusted God no matter what came. Paul trusted God if things were going good. But when things turned sour and things weren't going so well, Paul still trusted God. If the people heard the gospel and accepted it and believed it, and the great revival spread throughout an area and churches were planted, Paul had faith in God. But when the people of that area took Paul, threw him outside of the gates of the city and stoned him, they believed to death, Paul still had faith in God. When, Paul, uh, when, when churches were sending aid and sending money and Paul had everything he needed to sustain his physical needs, Paul had faith in God. But when no money was coming and everything had dried up, he still had faith in God. Paul had trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Paul understood that if he put his faith in anything outside of Christ, that he would falter, that he would fail, and he would be let down. So Paul put his faith in Christ. I, we were studying this morning about the, the Israel crossing the Red Sea. What a display of God, but how the people must have had, they had to put their faith in God in order to walk across the Red Sea. Now I understand circumstances made it where it kind of drove them across the Red Sea, but that's sometimes how God works too. But how we must put our faith in God, the same God that parted the Red Sea, the same God that closed up the Red Sea around Pharaoh's army and destroyed them all, the same God that would continue to lead the children of Israel. We must put our faith in a God who has never failed his people and will never fail his people. Now, you may say, Brother Matt, I trust you to do this. On this certain day, I need you to remember this and do this. There is a good chance I'm going to let you, if I don't write something down, if I don't burn it in my gray matter, I'm going to forget about it. I may let you down. Now, I don't want to let you down, but I may let you down. But Christ will never let you down. So Paul put his faith in Christ. So you know what Timothy did? Timothy was a person of faith. Timothy trusted God no matter what came. Timothy trusted and was dependent and his confidence in God was unshakable like Paul's was because he was following the example of Paul. Then Paul says, is my patience. Now, the next three things is patience, my love, and my steadfastness. Now, my patience and my steadfastness are very close to being the same thing. In fact, if you look at the definitions of these words, it would appear that they're the same thing. There's a slight difference, and we're going to talk about that. Paul says, you, you followed my patience. You're following after the same line of patience I had. This patience means this, holding up over a long period of time. Patience. Endurance. Holding up over a long period of time. Paul didn't just serve God for a short while. This is something we need to understand today. As believers, we need to understand... We may be dangerous at a short distance, but God's not called us to run a sprint. He's called us as Christians to run a marathon. And so we need to be careful that we don't tire over time and, and, and in essence quit on God. Because God's called us to live the rest of our lives for Him. I've seen people, well, they get excited. They come to church. They, 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 they say they've given their lives to Christ. They get all excited, all fired up. They're ready to charge hell with a water pistol for a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden, you don't see them anymore. The, 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 the FBI couldn't find them if they wanted to. They're gone. They're no longer at church. They, 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 where they were so faithful, they're gone. God's not called us to run sprints. God's called us to run a marathon. Understand this. Paul says, I've been patient. Over a long period of time I've endured. Over a long period of time I've trusted God. Over a long period of time I've believed how I was supposed to believe. Over a long period of time I've conducted my life with righteousness. Over a long period of time my aim has continued the same, which has been the gospel, glorifying God and the gospel. My faith has remained the same over a long period of time. Now, by, by, by no means am I telling you that Paul was perfect. He failed. But when he would fall, he would go back to Christ, trust Christ and get up and go again. He was patient. And so you know what Timothy decided? Timothy said, I don't want to be a fly-by-night kind of Christian. 
I don't want to be a, a paper fire Christian. You know what paper fire does? You light it, it burns bright, it burns hot for a few seconds, but it goes away quickly. God wants there to be some substance in our life some that, that will burn brightly for a long time. So he says, my patience. And Timothy followed his patience. And then his love. I believe this is love for God and love for others. I believe this is the great commandment that Jesus gave us in the Gospels. He said, love your God. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength. To love God. Love God passionately. Love God Unmovably, Love God unconditionally. Love God with everything that you are. That's what we're called to do. And then we're called to love our neighbor as ourself. To love others. To love our fellow man. We are called to love one another. And Paul loved God and Paul loved others. He gave himself for the gospel to be spread to others. Paul even said at one time, if it were possible, I would give up my own eternity in heaven to give it to the Jews who don't believe in Christ. I would rather be condemned to hell for eternity so that my brothers, the Jews, could go to heaven. Wow, what kind of a love. Now we know that was impossible for Paul to do, but what love that was for Paul to have. Paul loved God, Paul loved others. Timothy loved God, Timothy loved others. But then we see the seventh thing here. Paul says, Timothy, you followed my steadfastness. Now this steadfastness, it's, it's very similar to patience, except patience is holding up over a long period of time. Steadfastness holds more of the idea of holding up through a crisis. Holding up through a crisis. We go through crisis in our lives. We go through unexpected difficulties. And how easy is it to just question the love of God? Though it's foolish, we still do it. How easy is it for us to question the sovereignty of God? When a, we lose a loved one or, or, or there's a bad diagnosis or whatever it may be, how easy is it for us to question things about God? Why would you do this? God, there are people who don't love you who live good lives, it seems, and they, uh, it seems like they have all the money they need, it seems like they have all the health they need, and everything goes good for them. God, why? Why is someone who tries to love you going through all this suffering? Well, we understand it's not always that way. We understand that the ungodly suffer as well. It does happen. It's not just saved people that get diagnosed with cancer or whatever the case may be. But we also know this, that through it all, no matter what, I'm going to be steadfast because I have the Holy Spirit living within me that won't let me stop. I think of, I've mentioned this over the past few weeks, I think of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was preaching the Word of God faithfully, he was doing exactly what God told him to do. He preached with conviction the Word of God. And then a son of one of the priests came and beat him up, bloodied him, threw him into a pit, into, into the stocks. Timothy, when he got out, he says, I'll never more speak in the name of God. I will not prophesy for him. I will not preach for him. The very next sentence, before he could finish that sentence, he said, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up within my bones and I was weary. I could not stay. I could not stay in the state of, of quitting. He was able to endure through times of trouble, endure through times of trials. Because there is a faith and there is a love that God places in us through the gospel that will not let us stop. How in the world do people who don't love God go through tragedy? How are people who aren't saved go through tragedy? I don't know. But I understand this. It sure it does make it a little easier and it sure does make the burden light when we go through it with Christ. Paul says, I've endured. When things go bad... I endure because of Christ. Number eight, Paul says this, you followed my persecutions and sufferings. Now, if you think about this, I have spent this entire verse, this entire sermon so far on just verse 10. We're just now getting to verse 11. But here's what Paul says, you followed my persecutions and my sufferings that, that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured... I endured, yet from them the Lord rescued me all. Paul's rehearsing his first missionary journey. 
And Paul's reminding Timothy of everything that he went through, the persecutions he went through. Sometimes it was shipwreck. Sometimes it was hunger. But Paul says, I went through these things. I suffered for Jesus. But then he says this, Yet the Lord delivered me, rescued me from them all. What does he mean by that? Did someone go to hurt Paul and God stopped him from hurting Paul? That's not what Paul... No, Paul, Paul was beaten. Paul was bloodied. Paul got stoned. They cast large stones at his head to kill him. Paul was in prison. Well, how were you rescued? How were you delivered, Paul? Because he lived to preach another day. That's what he means. They knocked me down. They bloodied me. They hurt me. But I got up the next day and I went and preached the same message again that got me beat up. Paul says, I wouldn't stop. You, you, you know the sufferings. You know what I went through. And so, Timothy, you see what I've done. You go do it too. In America, we live in this nation that is they're, they're hostile against the gospel, but that hostility hasn't reached physical violence yet. Probably will, but it hasn't reached physical violence yet. It has over much of the world to Christians. We live in this bubble of time in which God has allowed us to go through this time where we're not physically persecuted. There, but, but you see that beginning to, 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 to kind of go away little by little and you see more persecution coming. You'll probably see financial persecution by taxation and things like that. Eventually you'll get physical. I, I believe that. I don't know how long, but I believe that. But no matter what comes, remember the example that Paul set and trust God, believe God, live for God no matter the cost. Paul says this in verse 12, and this is an astounding verse. I don't want us to miss this. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus... Now, there's no conditions here. This isn't... Not conditions. This isn't a maybe this will happen, maybe this won't happen. Paul says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, I understand there's levels of persecution. I, I get that. I understand that. But just let that verse sink in for a while. Then he says... While even, verse 13, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, things will progressively get worse, deceiving and being deceived. <laughs> the world is going to get worse. They're going to continue to go down and to persecute and to be deceived and to deceive. So what? That's a good question to ask a text. So what? What am I supposed to do? You're giving me all this information. What do you want me to do with it, God? Here's what Paul says. God through the inspiration, Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says this, but as for you, continue. Dear Timothy, continue. You have believed the right teaching. Chunky, you have conducted yourself in a righteous way of living. You have shared my aim to glorify God through the gospel. You have had faith. You have had patience. You have had love. And you have had endurance. And to some levels of degree, we live in a world that puts a spotlight on the church and hates them for it. So in a degree, we have suffered for the gospel, though it will go on to continue and to get worse. So continue on, church. Continue on, Timothy. Continue on, Chunky Baptist Church. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't go to a lesser degree of serving God, but continue on for the glory of God. Don't become a weak Christian. Don't fall out. Don't stop being faithful to the church. Don't stop these things, but continue no matter what comes your way, and there will be things comes your way that will tempt you to give up. Still live for God. Still go on. Be faithful to God because He is faithful to us. Continue, continue, continue. It reminds me of the speech that somebody gave one time. Uh, the leader of um, England, I believe, during World War II. You know his name. It's just left my mind at the moment. But he gave a speech. It was the prime minister of Great Britain and Churchill and, and, and he gave this speech and really the speech consisted of don't give up, don't surrender never give up, never give up never give up. Well that's what we're called to do. We are called to faithfulness church we're called to endurance we're called to patience we're called to continue on for the glory of God. Yeah we're going to be tempted to sin, yeah we're going to be tempted to fail and to be weak as Christians but don't give up continue on 
That's Paul's message to Timothy. I don't know what's on your heart this morning. I don't know how maybe the Lord has spoke to you through his word, but I do believe that we are called to continue. I do believe that we're called to faithfulness. All these things, all these attributes that Paul gave, Timothy followed. Well, what do you do next? Keep following them. Don't stop. It's going to get hard. You're going to get weary and tired. You're going to want to quit, but don't. Whatever you do, don't quit. Love God more. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for loving us. Father, I pray as we've looked in your word this morning, Father, that you would give us a spirit of, com of commitment. Father, let us hold on to the things that we've been taught and to the life that you've told us to live for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.